Hello and welcome to Innovative in Education's Organic Chemistry Series. My name is Mike Evans and I'm here to help you learn, so hopefully you'll get something out of today's lecture on what I find to be a very interesting topic, reaction coordinate diagrams and starting to think about reactions in terms of molecular orbitals. So let's go ahead and get started with a little review of what we learned last time. So last time we looked at reactivity in terms of electrons moving between nuclei, right? We represented this idea of the curved arrow from nucleophile, which is an electron-rich species, to electrophile, which is an electron-poor species, and said that this is how reactions occur. Bonds are formed when a nucleophile, which is an electron-rich species, donates to an electrophile. And upon that donation, we form a new chemical bond. Now, reactions are often multiple steps like this, and we call mechanisms sort of the sum of all of these steps occurring for a particular chemical reaction. So for instance, a reaction may have multiple mechanistic or elementary steps that all sort of follow this paradigm of a nucleophile attacking an electrophile that you see in the green box here. So today what we're going to look at is a deeper look at the energetics of this process and a deeper look at how molecular orbitals come into play and how we can add something to the conversation, so to speak, in thinking about molecular orbitals. So how do we represent the energetics of a reaction? Well, the first thing you should keep in mind is that every molecular species has an energy. And energy is sort of the link between structure and reactivity, right? It's the link between the structure of a compound, which determines its stability, and that compound's reactivity. Typically, we think about low-energy species as being very stable, high-energy species being unstable. And we measure the energy progress of a reaction on what's called a reaction coordinate diagram, which is what you're looking at right here. Now, this is an incomplete reaction coordinate diagram in the sense that the starting materials, transition states, and products aren't labeled yet. But what we have here are the axes for any reaction coordinate diagram you see. So, energy is represented on the vertical axis. So high energy species will be very high on this, uh, on this y axis. Low energy stable species will be more towards the bottom. On the x axis, what we have represented here is the progress of the reaction. And this is kind of an abstract variable. It can be a bond length in one of the reactants, a bond angle in one of the reactants or products. And it's just something to measure the progress of the reaction, how far along is the reaction. So the question we're answering with this is what's the relationship between the progress of the reaction, how far we are towards the starting materials or the products, and energy, the total energy of the system. Now when something like this is filled out, you'll typically see a smooth curve. And on such a smooth curve, you might see something like this. Starting materials up to a transition state, and then down to products. And in looking at something like this, there are a couple of things you should keep in mind. The first is that the starting materials and products are both in wells, right? They're in energy wells, which means that they're stable species that have to increase in energy in order to progress to any other kind of species. What we call the transition state is at the peak of the reaction coordinate diagram. And th this represents a species that lives for only one molecular vibration, but can actually have a very profound effect on the speed of a chemical reaction. So as the starting material has to get over the hump right, of this transition state, we can start to think about, well, lowering that transition state will lower the hump and speed up the reaction. We'll talk about that in a little more detail in a second. But this is the basic structure of every reaction coordinate diagram, starting at starting materials, going up to a transition state, and down to products. And of course, the relative relationship between these two energy-wise can differ. So the starting materials can be lower than the products, as they are in this case, or vice versa. And we can also flip reaction coordinate diagrams around. So the reaction from these starting materials to this product is in this direction on the reaction coordinate diagram. But to go from this product to that starting material, is this diagram essentially flipped completely around, where now we're moving in this direction. 
Now, when we think about the energies of reactions, we often think about this, this issue of thermodynamics versus kinetics. So the issue really boils down to there's a difference between the relative energies of the starting materials and products and the energy between the starting materials and the transition state, right? And these two energy differences control different things. So let's take a look first at thermodynamics and the ideas inherent in that concept. So I'll throw up for you a typical reaction coordinate diagram here again, this time placing the products lower than the starting materials, and there's our transition state. Thermodynamics deals with the stability and instability of the starting materials and products. It has nothing to do with the transition state energy. What that means is that the thermodynamics or the thermodynamic favorability of a reaction, whether it's favorable or unfavorable, as you'll often hear, depends on this energy difference right here, the energy difference between the starting materials and products. Reactions that proceed from stable to unstable materials move up in energy as we go from starting materials to products. So that's not represented here. This is an example of a favorable or st uh, spontaneous or downhill reaction where in going from the starting materials to the products, we lower the energy of the system. And because of that energy lowering, you can sort of see intuitively why this process would be favorable. Because we're going from a high energy, unstable situation in the starting materials to a more stable situation in the products. So this is thermodynamics. And this energy gap here, this, that energy gap, actually controls the amounts of products and starting materials that we would see under what, what's called equilibrium conditions. So under conditions where the starting materials and products are allowed to get over the transition state very rapidly. If they can do that, then essentially there will be, of course, more of the lower energy compound than the higher energy one, and their relative amounts will depend on the size of this gap. The larger the gap, the more the lower energy compound will have. So that's thermodynamics. It deals with amounts. Now let's think about kinetics and ask what that controls and where that control comes from. So in thinking about kinetics, the idea now is that the important energy difference here is the one between starting materials and transition state. So let's start drawing a typical reaction coordinate diagram but I'm going to stop at the transition state because kinetics really has nothing to do with the energy of the products. It's all about the energy from the starting materials to the transition state. This is interesting because the products, the reaction could be thermodynamically favorable or not. Really all kinetics depends on is this energy gap. And of course, if it's a large gap, we have a large hump to get over in starting the reaction. So this is a kinetically slow reaction. On the other hand, if the gap is small, then we have what is a kinetically fast reaction, one that presumably would go to products relatively quickly, at least relative to one with a larger energy gap. So that's kinetics. And what you can hopefully see from this idea of thermodynamics and kinetics is that there's a difference between the two, and they depend on different things. So to bring it all together sort of for you here, let's look at a reaction coordinate diagram and identify the energies that are important for thermodynamic and kinetic considerations. So in this hypothetical reaction here that I'm drawing, the energy difference here is the one that's critical for kinetic concerns. It's the energy difference here, or what you'll often hear referred to as the delta G value because it's a difference in free energies that's important, uh, controls the thermodynamics of the situation. 